you can make a living as an artist or you can make a living as a mathematician or you know in some math adjacent field but you can also just study math for its own sake for mm -hmm. the beauty of it mm -hmm. as it is and you could say the same I think of any of the arts or any of the humanities really. Master's degree here at Drexel and then you started teaching here I see and then mm -hmm a doctorate in education. Tell me more about the, the dissertation itself and the idea that, uh, that I was quite struck by in terms of your discovery of how students go about learning how to do proofs. I think there are broader implications and questions about just how we as individuals mm -hmm. and communities think about proof and justification and argumentation. As most education researchers are more interested in K-12, where the impact, I would argue, is, is greater, right, mm -hmm. in, the, in the long run of a student's educational journey. So there's less time and resources dedicated to studying math education at the college level. Mm -hmm. But we designed uh, an intervention, a workshop of sorts, to introduce students to proof writing who were, you know, the, their only exposure prior would have been like high school geometry. Mm -hmm. It was a great experience to have a small group to be able to work with on a regular basis and to really look at how they were thinking about what they were doing. Because mm -hmm. it's this pretty radical transition from calculus where you just compute stuff to exposition really mattering. Mm -hmm. And so I had them doing lots of writing and reflecting about the process itself. The real interest is in how that then translates to your work outside of just a math classroom right, because right. exposition matters and being able to communicate ideas is just as important as being able to generate them. Are there specific things that you're thinking about when you're when you say that learning how to do proofs might help us in other areas? The general framework that we worked with with these students was to go from the kind of information collecting stage to the brainstorming ways of connecting these ideas and um, definitions, theorems, et cetera, to then the exposition being a separate process. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was a junior undergrad, I took a class on Zen Buddhism at the same time that I was taking one of the first really, really challenging proof-based classes in my math curriculum. And I had this just like flash of insight writing a paper for the Zen class, which was also incredibly challenging. It just dawned on me like, oh, the approach to writing proofs that I've been learning in these math classes applies to writing this paper, because mm -hmm. I'm collecting ideas and definitions and connecting them in a logically cohesive way. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I try to convey to students generally in math, is that you know, math can be very much this training ground for how to think clearly, how to connect ideas, and how to communicate them clearly in any field or discipline. Like you asked, you know, what are some of the competencies? I would say it's the ability to A, have this free play kind of association um, between ideas that you encounter and then the refinement process mm -hmm. of writing the actual exposition. And those are the kinds of skills I think that you can translate to basically any field. So let's go straight to the word constructivism in okay. terms of creating a learning environment, a learning community in your classrooms. Tell us about that because it sounds like there's some parallels here. Probably the most formative educational experience I had that ultimately I think led me to this passion for education in math was my high school AP classes. And our teacher was pretty clear about the fact that she wanted the classroom to feel like a learning community. I remember occasionally one of us would pose a question and she would just have to hit pause like, all right, here's five problems. Occupy yourselves for 10 minutes while I figure this out. And that really blew my mind because it was the first time I had that experience with a teacher where they mm -hmm. were like, I'm going to let myself be stumped by your question mm -hmm. for a little bit and work mm -hmm. on it. It felt much more participatory rather than just, oh, you're the sage on the stage and you mm -hmm. give me all the answers. But really that experience that I had, I feel like really rooted my approach, which is to really make sure that students in my class feel heard, that they feel like all of their questions matter and are enlightening not just to them to get an answer, but also to their peers. One of the practices that I, I feel like I've incorporated over the years is to explore incorrect approaches and to see like, why doesn't this work? So to really help students feel like they're constructing the knowledge for themselves. Like, the joke is like, if you were locked in a room and you were told you have infinite ink and infinite paper, you have to solve this problem, um, 100% confident that every student 
that I have at Drexel University could do it. Do you have any pieces of advice on how to go about constructing that kind of environment? Are there some things you've learned along the way that are ways that people can kind of get started with this? The way I generally approach it is the more crucial a particular concept is and kind of far-reaching in its implications for their, you know, the future classes they're going to take, the more likely I am to really have them work on building the concept from the ground up themselves. I'm sort of selective about that and I refine this every year as to how many topics do I allow that right, right. sort of guided I was going to ask for. because in that kind of uh, approach, I can imagine oftentimes you're like, well, we need to get to this, that, that. How do you lose that need, that desire that a lot of professors you seem to have where you've got to check through a number of different things? Now in math, so for example, in political science, if you don't cover X, Y, or Z, not so bad, you know, you can recover. In math, I imagine there's aspects to it that are akin to malpractice in the sense that you've got a class that's afterwards or an engineer that needs it, and if they don't have it, they're in big trouble. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. Basically every major on campus mm -hmm. takes at least one math class. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, especially the first year classes that we have in the calc sequence that I often teach and coordinate, the learning outcomes for that class that that we expect um, by the end of each quarter don't just apply to math. Like, I try to approach it with trust that if the students see the value in having this kind of agency and ownership over their mm -hmm. math learning mm -hmm. uh, with some concepts that it'll translate to others. Yeah. This is a controversial question. Is I I could say either is or should the lecture be dead. Really, at the end of the day, it's hard to answer because, you know, the ideal student to teacher ratio would be like one to right. one, right? And in that case, there'd be no real need to lecture. Right. right. Yeah, I think the way I think about this question is the further I get from that, like what are the what are the compromises? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that are gonna make the most sense, mm -hmm. I guess. And that are gonna preserve as much as possible that spirit of collaborative inquiry and how does that change like the more students that we add to the classroom and how do we preserve as much of that mm -hmm. spirit as possible and then same with assessment is how do I preserve as much of the spirit of what it would be like to give an oral exam as possible mm -hmm. in the way I construct questions and rubrics mm -hmm. for grading those questions. Mm -hmm. Have you had much experience having students play that role in terms of assessing other students? Is that something that you think might be one way in which we can sort of scale up that assessment? Yeah, I think there's a, probably a part of every educator that wishes like grades just didn't matter, <laughs> right? And students too. But bearing in mind that part of what we're here to do is to assess how well students right. have learned and right. that's what they're here to receive. You know, when we talk about like how to prepare for an exam, one of the things I really encourage them to do is prepare as though you were giving a presentation. Prepare as though you're going to take an oral exam. Mm -hmm. If you had to decide between taking a quiz and you know giving a presentation, most of you would pick mm -hmm. the quiz, which mm -hmm. suggests mm -hmm. giving the presentation takes more mm -hmm. preparation. Interesting. What's your advice for someone who's just sort of landed here at Drexel as a new teaching professor? One of the things that's really remarkable about an institution like ours is that I've been here since 2010 and I still feel like I find new things that are happening. I think as someone who, for whom research is not required but is something that I do, you know, basically voluntarily, is to actively look for opportunities to do interesting things at the university, both within our college and the university as a whole. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. What about for the, the math student or the undergrad in any discipline that finds themselves yeah. in either Calc 1 or, or a statistics class? What would be your advice in order to help them get through? As an undergrad, it was really when I found a group of four other guys in the math department at Temple, who we were all taking mo mostly the same classes, yep. they just became the people I hung out with. Mm -hmm. And so posting up together in a room with a whiteboard and like mm -hmm. ordering some food mm -hmm. and hanging out and doing math problems together, mm -hmm. it just made learning more fun. So we see that there's a mathematics in music, mm -hmm. there's a mathematics in politics. I'm a PhD in political science. Both my parents were PhDs in music education. 
So why can't I do any math? <laughs> Explain. Uh, you didn't have math with me. <laughs> you can take these classes. All right, I'm yeah. there. Part of this maybe even goes back further for me. Like as a kid, my grandfather, who I grew up with, had probably like the equivalent of a seventh grade education from a village in Greece. And he would always, education was paramount for my family um, as I was like the first to go to college and mm -hmm. finish college and go to grad school and all that kind of stuff. Um, and my grandfather from the time I was a kid would always say, if you can learn math, you can learn any anything. That's what roped me in when I was a kid. More and more I find this is like the, the value in a liberal arts education generally is that if you can learn any of the liberal arts subjects, like they can all be an entryway to basically anything else that you want to learn. How, how does music, art, those sorts of things affect one's ability to do math? An appreciation for things like elegance and beauty mm. and symmetry. Like I think that's baked into mm. all of the mm -hmm. arts to some extent. Mm -hmm. and it goes back to your presentation about in a, in a proof how important yeah. that is. Yeah, so ideas like elegance and beauty and also that they are things that you can do for their own sake. 